of business today is approval of the agenda. Anyone have any changes or additions? If not, I'll entertain a motion to approve the agenda. So moved. This is motion. Is there a second? Second. Uh, any other discussion? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. And the motion or agenda is approved. Second order of business is approval of minutes for February 2015 or tw 25th, 2019. Um, I know that none of you were at that meeting, with the exception of myself. I will say they seem to accurately reflect what happened that evening. Uh, with that, does anyone have any changes or additions? If not, I entertain a motion to approve the minutes. I'll move the minutes uh, from okay. February 25th. Is there a second? Second. Any other discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 And then the minutes are approved. Next order of business is we are going to uh, do something a little different, have a quick moment of committee member introductions because we're all new. Um, I can tell you, I'm Deb Barber. I've been um, on the Metropolitan Council for four years now and I've been on the Transportation Committee the, in, that the entire time and chaired the Transportation Committee the last little while. But it's also, um, so that's where my interest in transportation comes from. But if you would share um, a little bit about your name, a little bit about yourself and why you're interested in serving on the Transportation Committee. We'll start. Council Member Stern. Okay, well, thank you. Um, so I'm Philip Sterner. I live in Burnsville. Uh, and I've been in Dakota County for 50 years. I worked on the Cedar Avenue Improvement Group, which where the red line came out of, and I've also helped them as a legislator get a park and ride for Rosemont. So transportation is really a big focus <laughs> and love what I have all the way down to, you know, strollers or wheelchairs, uh, what I call wheelability, the walking and inviting trails and wildlife to you know, transit and, and that. So I'm very excited to be on this committee and I hope I'll be able to be a great contribution. Councilmember Chambliss. Thank you. Reva Chambliss, District 2. I live in Brooklyn Park. I'm very excited on being on the Transportation Committee. I worked with the Blue Line Station area planning quite a bit. I regularly take uh, the bus, and I really feel like we should uh, use transportation infrastructure to build strong communities and uh, also make sure that the decisions that are made are equitable and beneficial to all. Okay. Councilmember Ferguson. Uh, Chris Ferguson, District 3. I live in Eden Prairie. Uh, I worked a lot on the Green Line construction and, and chaired a group called the Business Resources Collaborative, which supported 800 or so businesses uh, up and down the Green Line. And I also served on the Corridor of Opportunity Policy Board, which um, worked to sort of make a number of investments along the Green Line um, during that process. Uh, I work, I've lived in a, and worked in a few other cities that have transit systems a little more advanced than ours, maybe in Toronto and New York. Um, and lived there without a car. It was a bit of a shock when I moved here almost 20 years ago now and realized uh, if you live in the suburbs, it's pretty much impossible to, uh, to live in the Twin Cities without a car. But um, so uh, my interest in transit is, you know, is, is fairly broad. I've used transit systems in probably 10 or 12 different countries around the world and, and many of the metropolitan areas around the, the U.S. Okay. Council Member Rosarin. Hello, I'm Ray Zirin. Uh, I live in Coon Rapids. I represent District 9. Uh, I believe in a multimodal transportation system, and I believe it's uh, the direction to go for equity within for, for all people, and um, I'm excited to get to work. Okay. Councilmember Fredson. Chris Fredson from St. Paul, District 14. I uh, live three blocks off uh, the A-line and Route 70 and 74 on the bus line. Um, I believe we need a connected region so people can uh, live and work where they choose. Councilmember Cummings. I am Molly Cummings. I represent District 5. I live in Hopkins. Uh, I'm the former mayor of Hopkins until last Tuesday of last week. Um, I, as mayor, have heard from our businesses, from our residents, from our seniors, from our individuals with disabilities, uh, the importance of a robust transit and transportation system that can get people to their jobs and allow our seniors to enjoy the amenities in the Midwest and enjoy, uh, have our businesses uh, fully employed. Um, several of our businesses aren't able to uh, attract and retain the uh, employment uh, workforce that they need because of the limits of transportation out there. So I've been involved in the planning of the Green Line extension for the four years that I was on the city council and four years as mayor. So I'm excited to continue the work on that. 
and uh, we fully that we need a, a robust transportation system that works for everyone. Thank you, Councilmember Gonzalez. Thank you, uh, Francisco Gonzalez. I live in Cottage Grove, and uh, my interest in this committee is because I'm a firm supporter of the Gold Line and the proposed Red Rock Corridor. I do believe that mass trans transportation that is sustainable, efficient, and affordable is key for the development of our region. I had the opportunity to live in Madrid, Spain, a major world city that has an excellent public transportation system, and I, I know how that can work to sustain a, a vibrant economy and a social life, so I will hope that we can do the same here. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Atlas Ingerbetson. Thank you, um, Madam Chair. Uh, my name is Linnea Atlas Ingerbretson, and I live in Golden Valley and represent District 6. Um, I lived car free for 10 years, five of those years here, and five years in Denver, um, and um, did so by using non motorized transportation, but which requires there being a strong um, bus and train um, transportation system in order to do that, and really think that's very important for our communities. I think it's also important for building walkable communities where people can really um, experience a healthy way of living by um, being able to be active in their communities. And that we need to value all trips um, the same, not just commute trips at the beginning of the day and the end of the day, Monday through Friday, but all trips that enable people from all kinds of communities and backgrounds to be able to get where they need to get to to do what they need to do. Thank you very much and welcome to you all. You will enjoy the work of this committee. It's by no means the easiest committee here, and so we appreciate you um, wanting to serve in this role. It's very much appreciated. Uh, next, we move on to typically in our meetings, we have reports now, whether it's from um, our tab liaison, um, but we also have from our uh, division leads. So we will start with MTS Director Thompson. And if you haven't met, this is Nick Thompson. Uh, committee members, council members, welcome. My name is Nick Thompson. I'm the director of the Metropolitan Transportation Services Division, one of the divisions at the council. MTS is our acronym, so that's your first acronym to learn tonight. Uh, first of many. Of many. Um, so our division, we're going to give you a broad overview tonight in the info section, so I won't get into too much details, but we're in charge of the long-range transportation planning for all modes in the region. We also operate the contracted transit services for the Met Council, which involves things like Metro Mobility, but also some fixed route. And then we manage a lot of grants and financial resources. So we'll give you a broad update on all of those functions within our division tonight. Um, we are a division of about 54 staff uh, total, so quite a different scale than like the Metro Transit Division. But we are one that are very externally focused. We are working with every city and county on the transportation planning function, the federal funding as the MPO, as you've heard a little bit about, like we're the MPO for the region, so federal funded projects flow of all modes flow through the council and we manage that process as staff in our division. So we're working with all the partners that receive federal funding on their projects. Um, and through transit, we manage a large fleet of transit through contractors and we'll get into those details. So. Though we're a small division in terms of people, we have, for example, more buses in our fleet than Metro Transit. We have this large transit service that we provide. So uh, we have a, a lot of extended, essentially, employees of the council through these contracted services. Um, typically, what I cover in this director's report, we do a director's report each time. Um, I cover issues of interest to the committee around what our division is doing, but also during this time of year, I provide any legislative updates for any bills that may be ripe at the, since the last time we met, uh, that's things to keep in touch on. I talk about any upcoming opportunities for stakeholder engagement that you may be of interested in or any policy activities that are coming that, uh, that you might want to participate in. Um, I'll provide any operational updates that you need to know. Uh, for the past month, we've been providing a lot of weather-related operational updates, so uh, none tonight. I won't provide any tonight, uh, other than it looks a much better week this week. Um, so we kind of providing general updates like that uh, from the region. Um, tonight, also attached to the agenda were the work plans for Metro Transit and MTS. Um, we adopt those for this committee each year. We adopted them in December, and obviously you're new to the council, and we can modify these as your interests come. But uh, for, for MTS, there's a couple areas in this work plan. Um, any policy plan changes, the, the 
TPP was adopted in October last year, but we're already on amendment number two policy to the policy plan, which will be coming through this committee. And so those are a couple that we had planned for this year. We also do, re we lead regional planning studies for transportation or partner with um, MnDOT on several of these studies. And they usually take 12 to 18 months. And so at different times we check in with this committee to provide an update and seek input on those regional planning studies. And so we have some of those that will come before this committee this year. And then we have our cycle of regular items. Uh, the first business item you see tonight is a TIP amendment. You'll see a lot of those throughout the year. And so we're gonna give you an overview of what those are, but those are examples of some items that we have. We have budget amendments. We have contracts for contracted services, amendments to our policy plan, TIP amendments. All of those are regular business of this committee that we bring through through MTS. So, um, so you'll hear, hear more from our leadership team later about each of these divisions, but I'll close with something as a gift. Uh, this is the transportation acronym glossary from our TPP. And you can page through this as terms come up and you get a little background, but I thought I'd give you a hard copy of that that you can take with you and add to your stack of papers that you began to collect since you started. And I don't know if you have one of these or so. With that, I usually close with, uh, that's my update, and I would entertain any questions that you would have on MTS or anything I reported. Okay, any questions for Director Thompson? All right, if not, we'll move on to the report from General Manager. And if you haven't met him, this is West Bush. Welcome. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm looking forward to working with all of you and wrestling through some of the issues that we have to wrestle with as a transit provider and both policy issues and operational issues and uh, and also the challenge of expanding service in, in this uh, in this metro region that I've all heard you all mention is important to you and I want you to know it's important to us as well. We're excited about the governor's initiative. You're going to be hearing more about that in future meetings, uh, but it is an opportunity uh, for us to to, uh, to actually think about how we can expand and improve services. If I'm sure many of you are aware that we've been facing uh, uh, deficits uh, uh, in the horizon for a number of years now. The money we've we received recently for, from, the, from the state legislature has been one-time money, so we end up asking for the same money twice. Uh, we've been funded with one-time money for long-term <coughs> problems, so that's why I'm mentioning right off the bat our uh, our uh, excitement about the governor's position and the governor's proposal because we need resources to improve services in this region and uh, we've had to we've had to manage and operate very conservatively in an environment of of, uh, of deficits and uh, that's that's not a vision we want to have a vision for the region and and we're we're anxious to hear and work with you on your vision for this for this region um, we we do what you imagine that we do. We uh, provide the bus service and we provide the, the light rail service as well as the commuter rail service from the North Star coming from Big Lake uh, on through. Uh, the bus service, as you know, is our is our workhorse. It's the it's probably delivers, I think, in the neighborhood of about 70 percent of our of our rides, uh, if not more. But people tend to talk about light rail an awful lot. Light rail takes up most of the space in the room during the discussions. We're excited about the light rail projects. We're excited about Southwest LRT. We've 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 got the letter of no prejudice. We're planning to start construction this spring, and uh, but we're excited about uh, other things as well. Uh, we're excited about the success of the A line. You mentioned that you were. Uh, a council member that you were that you were uh, live along the A line, so you've seen the success of an A line that is that has increased service in that corridor by 30 percent, and we see a lot more potential in in uh, in similar arterial bus rapid transit lines in this region that will that will really improve service if if we have the financing allows to go forward. We're going to be opening up C line in in June 8th. There's just a lot of there are despite. Our financing issues, there's a lot of exciting things co coming up. You also hear about other issues that we're dealing with, uh, use of transit as shelter. Uh, that's a reflection of, of, uh, of uh, a challenge to this whole region in terms of unsheltered individuals. Um, we, are, uh, we are an agency that, that uniquely serves everybody in this region. So we deal with everything, every problem, every challenge, every issue this region deals with. And you will see it on 
our trains and on, on our buses. So we'll have plenty of time to talk about that. We'll have plenty of time to talk about uh, fair policy, uh, talk about the future expansion opportunities uh, and other, other issues, both, ex both exciting and challenging issues here. Um, you will receive most of our orientation at the next meeting on the 25th. So you'll get more, I'll let you, I'll wait till then for you to become a little more familiar with how our, how our uh, division operates. Uh, so today I'll just give a few reports about some immediate things that are occurring that uh, we want you to be aware of. And typically I'll give reports about events that are coming up or, or just news about transit that is, that is available. And, uh, and then uh, again, I'll, I'll, if you have any questions, I'll be glad to answer them. First of all, St. Patrick's Day free rides. Uh, free rides will be provided to all Metro Transit, MBTA, and, Ano and Anoka Transit routes from 6 p.m. Uh, on Saturday, March 16th through 3, uh, 3 a.m. Sunday, March 17th. People are up later than I am, I might, I might mention. <laughs> and so that's in celebration of St. Patrick's Day. The 23rd annual free ride promotion is sponsored by Miller Lite, which offsets the costs of free rides in cities across the country to discourage drinking and driving, and it's a real, uh, uh, it's a real popular program uh, in, in terms of law enforcement. They really appreciate that that program's in place. It helps, it helps their, their needs, and it serves the public well. Uh, we have driver, Transit Driver Appreciation Day. Um, we should call that, we call our drivers operators, but we'll say Transit Driver Appreciation Day. And, and we'll celebrate our bus and train operators next Monday on March 18 for Transit Driver Appreciation Day. Uh, for those of you who use transit on a regular basis, please say thank you to your transit driver and operator. I've been general manager just for a couple of months, and I can't tell you how much I appreciate the work that they do. And think about the, I've gotten a first-hand look at the challenges they have. Uh, especially in the extreme weather conditions we've had these first couple of months of this of this year, two or three months. Um, anyway, to mark the occasion, customers will be encouraged to submit uh, commendations, write thank you cards, and share their support on social media. Complimentary breakfast and lunch will also be served at each of the garages. Council members are invited to join operators at our East Metro uh, East Metro Garage for lunch beginning at 11:30. AM. We are especially excited to have students from St. Paul. Uh, and we'll get, if you haven't received something, we'll send something out uh, as an invitation to, to your email. Um, we'll have students from St. Paul's Focus Beyond who are frequent transit riders join us at the same time. These students have designed special greeting cards for Transit Driver Appreciation Day. Um, the Hayward tour, uh, I believe our next meeting is going to be at Haywood on, on uh, March 25th, and we want to invite those of you who are interested to join us for a tour of the Haywood facilities by meeting us in the Haywood chambers. Um, if you walk into the, into the door of, of the Haywood building, uh, there will be a, uh, someone at the reception desk, and she can point you towards Hayward, <coughs> Haywood chambers if, if you're not acquainted with where that's at, but we'll meet you at Hayward Chambers at 2.45 p.m. and we'll provide a tour of the garage and a tour of the transit control center and we'll promise to be done in time for your meeting at 4, at 4 p.m. that day. And then finally, I want to share a brief and well-received video that we recently created with local improv comedian Tane Danger. Uh, this is the first of several videos that will provide a comedic response to the question hey, where does this bus go? So I believe that's a cue for the, Greg in the back room to put that up on our, on our screen. My name is Tane Danger. I am here at the Uptown Transit Center. I uh, ride the bus a lot, but a lot of times uh, you see a new bus, you see a bus route and you think, oh, I don't really know anything about that bus route. So today we're gonna start something brand new. Uh, it's a series that I like to call, hey, where does this bus go? So we're gonna start with a bus that I actually ride quite a bit in my life. It's called the 23. And we're gonna figure out where does this bus go? It's gonna be great. All right, let's go. I love this microphone. So. Okay, let's go on. Let's get on the bus. Where are we right now? We're at Lake Street and Hennepin Avenue going south. I wouldn't want to talk this early in the morning either. Okay, another big landmark here, uh, Lakewood Cemetery. 
I bike most of the time. Oh, you bike most of the time. Even right now when it's like two degrees outside. That's why I'm on the bus. <laughs> yeah, that's smart. This is one of the places it goes, which is Nickel and 38th. Fun fact, we're, we're going by my house. They don't care. It's fine. I'm going to the school. Actually, I am a teacher, so. Oh, you're a teacher. Yeah. What do you teach? I teach fourth grade. Fourth <laughs> grade? That sounds hard. <laughs> yeah, it is. The light rail <laughs> ate up a lot of our friends on the bus, but you gotta, you gotta take that journey then, and you gotta say goodbye to this part of your life and start a new life on the blue line. Why is the 23 so great? Life is great, and being part of this community makes it even greater. Can you tell me the love story of the 23? How did you fall in love with it? The people on this route. The fact that people can relax and talk to one another and talk to me. Community, neighborhood, small town, however you want to put it, it's home. Melanie is, like, she knows pretty much all the regulars. We're Facebook friends. <laughs> You're Facebook friends with Melanie? <laughs> We are passing right now through beautiful Longfellow, Minneapolis. If I were riding this bus for the first time, all of a sudden you take a right down this residential street and you think, oh no, maybe the bus driver is just driving to their house and they have decided to stop for the day and I'm going to have to go live with them. But that's not what's happening. This is very dramatic. We will be crossing over the Ford Parkway Bridge. And look it, I'm just going into St. Paul right now as though it weren't like a foreign country. We are in Highland Park now, so we're doing a little halftime check-in. I did not know, by the way, that you, um, you had a phone here. Yes. You can call for pizza? Oh. No, we can't call for pizza, sorry. I have met people on the bus, and you can get just about anywhere you need to go. I do not have a car, so for me, the bus is the greatest way to travel. Why is the 23 so great? Um, I have no idea, <laughs> but it's good. If you were to sort of characterize the 23 as a brand of chocolate bar, what, what would you call the 23? Oh, wow. I don't know. <laughs> if the 23 were a type of hot dish, what kind of hot dish would it be? Macaroni. Macaroni? Are most of the time. It's smooth most of the time. That's good. It seems like whether you like people or you like being alone, uh, this bus has, has everything for you. That's the end of the ride. Sort of anticlimactic. It feels like there should be confetti that falls from the top of the bus. This was very fun. Thank you for coming along. But there we go. We're going to be producing uh, a few more of those. I think there's one in production now, and there, there's a couple others that, that are being planned. And it's, again, as you can tell, it's, it's to give people a good feeling about the bus, to promote the bus in a positive way and to promote, to promote transit in a positive way. So uh, we'll share more with you uh, through email, and links in email and so forth as they come out. Thank you. Okay. Anyone have questions for general manager? Uh-oh. Council member Atlas. Thanks. I'm scared. I'm going to break that mic. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Um, I, just a, a, a quick comment. I look forward to learning more about the deficit that has been carried over and what are the structural issues leading to that. So I just really am excited to, to learn more about that. One um, thought or idea, I love the really fun video. It would be great to see a diversity of cultures and locations and language be incorporated with um, using a tool like that. For so many of our growing demographic groups, um, communicating orally is the best way to connect with them. So um, just if that's an idea to share, um, it'd be nice to see. And we have so many rich, wonderful comedians from across all our communities. Um, it'd be great to see the demographics of our ridership reflected in the promotional and educational materials we're producing. Absolutely. Thank you. I have one question. Um, so for a transit driver appreciation day, is there uh, events only at the East Metro Garage or at others? Um, well, the, 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 the celebration occurs on all our bus routes. If you're there, please say thank you. The, East Met, the, the lunch is at the East Metro Garage. That's where we're inviting, but you're welcome to visit the other Metro Garages as well. And just a comment to our new council members, I highly recommend you do this at some point. Um, it's a chance to get out and um, interact directly with the operators and the people at the garages. And um, this is a, I mean, 
uh, obviously this is an event day, but there's other times to do it too. Um, but I would highly encourage you to do that at some point. So if you get a chance, um, um, we'll have, get the information um, out to you on the events for this coming, upcoming appreciation day. But uh, it's something that you definitely want to do at some point. All right. And thank you both. And now we will move on to our business for the evening. There are no items on consent. Uh, we have three non-consent items. The first one is 2019-54 same week, which is a tip amendment. And we have Joe Barbo. Thank you, Madam Chair. So um, we're being asked by the Transportation Advisory Board to approve a tip amendment, which normally <laughs> would be a pretty quick item. But uh, given that a lot of you probably don't have a lot of experience with the tip, uh, we thought we'd go through that a little bit. So the TIP stands for Transportation Improvement Program. <clears throat> and the Transportation Improvement Program is required for all metropolitan planning organizations uh, in the country. Um, it's a four-year list of transportation projects planned to be funded in whole or part using federal funds. Any federally funded project needs to be uh, included in the TIP before it can um, be under construction. It has to include um, also regionally significant projects that affect air quality. This is because uh, our region has... Um, uh, while we are in attainment for air quality, uh, we are uh, still um, being monitored by the federal government for at least the next eight or so months. Um, and then um, after a TIP is approved by this board or by the council, uh, it uh, is incorporated into MnDOT's statewide transportation improvement program, which is the final step before a project can be uh, underway uh, in this process. So right now we're in the, we're about two thirds three quarters of the way of the 2019 through 2022 uh, TIP. Um, so the first year of the TIP, 2019, we are in that year. Um, uh, fiscal year 2019 started on July 1st, 2018 and runs through July, I'm sorry, June 30th of 2019. Uh, so the next fiscal year starts on, on July 1st of 19. Um, this TIP uh, is not too different from recent years. Uh, the total funding for uh, all projects in the TIP is approximately $4 billion for highway transit highway, transit, freight, bicycle, and pedestrian projects. Um, just over, just about a third of that is, uh, federal, is comes from federal highway funds, $874 million in federal transit funds. And you can see that we have uh, the state, um, Minnesota State Trunk Highway Funds and um, other matching funds, uh, often local matches from uh, the communities. So um, these projects in the tip, I wanna say there are about 250 of them. Um, who programs them? So. You look at the top bullet, that is, those are the projects programmed through our regional solicitation, which you might have read about, where we end up, uh, where we program about $100 million per year to um, uh, the local governments and other agencies in the region, and that is programmed by TAB and the council. Um, MnDOT programs the majority of the projects um, using federal highway funds and state funds. Uh, usually, uh, for mostly roadway projects, they do program some non motorized transportation projects as well. Uh, Metro Transit and the Suburban Providers program projects using federal formula funds for transit. And then the council approves um, <laughs> approval of TIP covers all of these projects. So all projects must be approved by the regional MPO, which is the council. And so now we're, we're dealing with the TIP amendment today. And uh, there are various thresholds for TIP amendments to be required uh, when a change to a project needs to be made. So if there's a new project being that is in the TIP, that would have to be an amendment that would come through this board. Um, a, a change in the project scope or a cost change of significance, and there is a, an actual um, a table of what would, uh, what would meet that level of significance for a cost change that would need to go through the process. And then any changes in pro project termini of over, I believe it's three tenths of a mile. So smaller changes or changes of program years, minor cost changes, um, funding source changes, technical corrections, do not need to go through this process. They are done administratively um, without going through uh, the board. So like today you'll be approving a TIP amendment or asked to recommend approval to the council, I should say, of a TIP amendment. Um, there are four key criteria to do so, um, consistent with expected funding level, which means that it's fiscally constrained. Um, and the, the sheet that you'll have, that you have in front of you, will discuss that. Um, consistent with the regional transportation plan, uh, which it will be. Um, and conforming with Clean Air Act requirements, that refers to the non-attainment discussion that I brought up a little bit ago, and then the opportunity for public input, which comes through at meetings such as this one. So um, I'll talk a little bit about today's TIP amendment, which is in your packet and looks like this. 
And uh, we do have um, somebody from MnDOT here, as I think we do. <laughs> I've never met him, um, to, to answer questions if there are any. Um, and so this is a tip, uh, a project located at uh, I-35 from Portland Avenue to Washington Avenue in Minneapolis. Um, and this is a existing project that's being changed in scope. So the length of the project is being reduced from 1.56 miles to 0.95 miles. And you'll see the description where that one, the phrase AD, ADA upgrades is being changed. I know when it went through tab, there was a question about why if the project is going from 1.56 miles to 0 0.95 miles is the, um, is the cost staying the same. And the reason for that is, is that it's very, very common for projects as we move through the tip years to adjust their costs uh, because of materials or other types of inflation or, or um, other uh, cost adjustments that may come through. So that is actually not too unusual. I guess that is the last slide that we have. Um, so I don't know if you want me to go more into this project, um, but otherwise I'd stand for questions about the tip for this project. Are there any questions for the presenter? Uh, Councilmember Sterner. Thank you. I just, maybe if you could just go in the project it, itself with the you know, 0.95 miles and that I'm familiar with the area, but the scope okay. of the project. Is um, so the, the, the pros action is that the council concur with TAB to uh, change the scope. And so the um, <clears throat> the amendment would, would, like I said, it would reduce the length of one point uh, from 1.56 miles to 0.95 miles and re remove the phrase ADA ADA upgrades from the description. So um, the rationale for removing that phrase is because, uh, you know what, I'm, I is Christian here? I'm gonna have Christian Holberg from um, MnDOT explain why uh, the phrase ADA upgrades is being removed. But um, this is the kind of, you know, a change like this is the kind of thing that would require a TIP amendment. But I'm gonna let thank Christian you. explain that, uh, what's really being done in the project. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> So specifically uh, for this project, ADA upgrades uh, means that we were planning to install uh, APS or the, the push buttons that are audible um, at, the, at the intersection of Washington Avenue and 35W. Um, and as project development progressed, uh, it became apparent that the, the signal systems that are in place today uh, do not have the capability to accept APS. Um, and so the... Um, we were looking to pull that from this particular project and we'll be planning a subsequent project to replace those signal systems and install the APS at that time. Okay, very good. Any other questions? Right. If not, then I would entertain a motion. Uh, one question. Uh, Council Point Member Chambliss. Thank you. Point of clarification. So are you saying that uh, the cost of updating the ADA system is just being deferred? Uh, and at, at what point is that cost going to be revisited? Um, so we've, uh, it, the question is the, the, the cost and the, the scope to actually install the APS. Yes. Um, yes, we'll be deferring that. And uh, I initiated a, a project to, uh, initiated a project to scope that and deliver it for a fiscal 2024 okay. project. I think um, <clears throat> we would look for opportunities with our local partners if there's a if there's an opportune time to do that before 2024 um we'll continue to evaluate that but uh, for now 2024 fiscal 2024 would be when we would deliver that thank you okay any additional questions for the presenters all right if not i'd entertain a motion to approve the action so moved is there a second i'll second any other discussion all those in favor say aye Aye. Aye. Opposed, nay, and the motion carries. Thank you, gentlemen. All right, our next item um, on the business is item 2019-49. We have Chris Royston here to present. Good afternoon. Madam Chair, my name is Chris Royston. I'm the manager of overall, light rail vehicle overall and special projects. Uh, the proposed action today is for the Met Council to approve the purchase of four motor trucks and four axle sets uh, for the Type 2 light rail uh, vehicle overhaul program. Uh, currently, we operate 91 LRVs, 
Uh, 27 of them are Bombardier LF-70s. You'll hear us refer to them as Type 1s, as well as 64 Seaman S-70s. Uh, we refer to those as Type 2s. Um, the best way to tell them apart, uh, if you're out in the field, if you're out in uh, the public, I should say, there's a number on the side. It's 100 series are for the Type 1s. 200 series are for the Type 2s. Uh, looking at this picture before us, uh, the one on the left, the Type 1 has uh, external, or well, has mirrors on the side versus the Type 2s have camera system uh, mm -hmm. in place. The uh, Type 1 LRVs went into service in, the, uh, in 2004. Uh, the first LRV currently, well, last summer reached the 1 million mile mark. Uh, currently, half of the Type 1s have surpassed the 1 million mile uh, milestone. The uh, Type 2 LRVs went into service 10 years later in 2014. Uh, they are currently surpassing 350,000 miles. Uh, we transport 72,000 people to and from each day on those vehicles, with uh, each LRV traveling on average 68,000 miles a year, and the fleet combined fleet mileage of 6 million miles a year. Uh, the overhauls are based on the recommended mileage per the OEM. Uh, certainly, we don't settle for just the uh, recommended mileage per the OEM because the vehicles they have in service, uh, for instance, our S70s, they run those in San Diego. It's kind of a different climate than what we have now. So what we'll do is we'll send components out uh, randomly to be assessed uh, to see if we're going to meet that milestone. Uh, the motor truck overhaul uh, is uh, for the 64 Type 2. LRVs, and that's scheduled to start next year. This picture here, if you look at it, uh, you'll see three uh, compartment doors open along the side. Uh, the first one would be for the motor truck, the middle for the um, um, center truck, and then further down you'll see one for the other end. We have uh, our vehicles two cabs so that they can be driven uh, from either cab. Uh, here's a close-up picture of a motor truck that's in place. Uh, the motor truck is the um, primary propulsion system. That's a fancy way of saying uh, motors and uh, gearboxes. Uh, we run electric motors, of course. Uh, for a reference point, to, this is, to remove that motor truck and get to this point right here requires about eight hours. So it's quite labor intensive. Um, in this picture here, you can see, and I wish I had a pointer, my apologies, <laughs> but there are two gearboxes and two motor trucks on uh, each axle. And an axle would be that right there. So that axle, there's two axles on each motor truck with a gearbox and a traction motor on each axle. Uh, purchase wise, uh, the motor truck that we're gonna be, motor trucks that we're buying, we're buying at $485,000 each and each axle set is $140,000. Uh, yes, that's light rail and it's very expensive. Um, now, we were able to get uh, uh, those at, um, if it's approved, we're able to get those at a production cost. Uh, typically, if these vehicles weren't in production, meaning the Type 3s weren't going to be in production, we'd be paying about $700,000 for a motor truck and roughly three or $400,000 for an axle. As I stated before, we operate 64 Type 2 LRVs with each LEV having two motor trucks and each motor truck having two axles. Uh, that equates to 128 motor trucks and 256 axles. Uh, the LRV Type 2 overall is a three-year project, two overall components and subcomponents of the LRVs, which includes the motor trucks and axles. Uh, to maintain that schedule requires four motor trucks. Might, that might be more helpful, sorry about that. To maintain that schedule requires four motor trucks and eight axles to be overhauled each month. In addition to the motor trucks uh, and axles required to keep all LRVs in service, we have six spare motor trucks and four spare axles. Uh, those components are kept in a ready status. So in the event of a required maintenance, we're able to just readily change those out, right? Um, having four of those spares uh, being overhauled would be problematic. The requested purchase will allow us to have, will allow overhaul department to the required number of components. Uh, we deem those as float material to maintain project schedule. So we'll be able to do overhaul uh, four components enough to maintain a three-year schedule, while at the same time 
uh, keeping the uh, required spares in place for day-to-day -day operations. Uh, this uh, uh, does support the Thrive Lens analysis uh, by the purchase support by the outcome and helping to ensure continued safe, reliable, affordable, environmental friendly uh, service to our customers. A lot of our customers, this is their primary mode of transportation. We have to make sure that you know that we are as re reliable and as efficient as possible. Uh, this purchase is fully funded uh, with federal and local uh, funds. And at this time, there is no known opposition. Madam Chair, I'm prepared to answer any questions if you have some. Any questions? Council Member Zarant. Yes, Mr. Rolston? Royston. Royston, yes. I apologize. Um, what happens to the trucks after they get removed? Could you repeat, please? What happens to the truck after it's uh, removed and, and you install a, a new one? Where's that old one going? Okay, so uh, maintenance. Des describe the process, if you will, please. Absolutely, absolutely. So main the maintenance department is made up of really uh, two areas. Running repair, which is uh, located running repair green line and running repair blue line. Green line is located in the downtown St. Paul facility. Uh, blue line running repair is uh, at Hiawatha. Then there's the overhaul department. Running repair is responsible for the day-to-day -day servicing of the, the vehicle. So anything that comes to them, they should be able to get it out within a day or two, typically. Uh, the overhaul department uh, is comprised of both component repair and electronic repair. So the truck comes off, um, it comes off as a core. Uh, it would need to be fixed or overhauled. Uh, all running repair is going to be concerned about is do they have a spare in stock? So they're going to pull that truck out of service and then go to the um, parks department and pull another truck. That truck that comes out of service, that comes migrant. Then we would either affect the repair or overhaul that truck. Uh, in the case of the overhaul project itself, uh, you know, it would be a couple things going on. One would be old trucks being fully overhauled and then also spare trucks being uh, repaired and put back in service or put made readily available for service. I don't, that answers your question. Yes, thank you. Any additional? Council Member Cummings. Thank you, Madam Chair. Is it anticipated that uh, the Type 2 LRV will be what's used on the Green Line extension or will there be a Type 3? Uh, Madam Chair, Council Member, um, we will be getting what's going to be called a type three uh, LRV. And essentially it's the type two LRV uh, with some uh, modifications. So the, for, the for the extension, there'll be a whole new set. Uh, I believe it's 27 LRVs for the expansion. Thank you. Any additional questions for the presenter? <clears throat> I just have a- Councilmember uh, Gonzalez. Um, Mr. Roy Stanora, or chair. Um, my understanding is that Bombardier is a Canadian company and Siemens is a German company. Uh, are there any American producers of this uh, engines that we can see if they can produce that for us? Madam Chair, Council Member, uh, the motors for the Siemens vehicles are Siemens motors, so it's proprietary. Okay. Uh, you know, we're stuck with those. For the Bombardier uh, train, we uh, use Toshiba motors. And those are what came with the train. Uh, again, they're proprietary. You cannot change out a motor. Uh, you know, the vehicle is built for that. So we are, uh, we are required to use that motor. Okay, thank you. All right, any other questions for the presenter? All right, the, the action that we're looking for is that the Metropolitan Council authorizes the purchase of four motor trucks and four axle sets for the type two LRVs in the amount not to exceed $2,500,000. So with that, I would entertain a motion to approve. So moved. And is there a second? Second. Any other discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed nay. And the motion carries. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Royston. Thank you. All right, our last item of business tonight is item 2019-56, which is Mall of America curve replacement. We have Tom McGannon and Mark Lehman. Welcome to the committee. Chair and members of the committee, my name is Mark Lehman, I'm lead project manager in Metro Transit uh, Engineering and Facilities. I'm here with Tom McGannon to speak to you about the Mall of America curve replacement project. 
Uh, before we get into the business item, I'd like to uh, provide some background. Um, rail infrastructure can be broken down into three major components. One, uh, first is the track, which is rail, ties, and switches, and ballast, and stuff like that. Uh, traction power is the second one, and that's primarily the overhead catenary wires, the substations that supply power to those catenary wires, and then the return electrical circuits that return the electrical uh, back to the substation. And the third is signal and communications, uh, which is signaling that controls the train movements, communications that allows the trains to communicate to rail control center and street traffic signals, and communications that allow train engineers in the cab to communicate with rail control center and on-track workers. Like everything else, rail infrastructure wears out over time. Uh, some areas that have heavy use, such as curved rail and switches, wear early and needs to be replaced at a higher frequency. Other items that are technology-based, like signals and communications, get outdated and are not serviceable over time. The blue line went into service back in 2004. The blue line now is beginning to show its age in certain areas in our system. In 2017, Transit began a blue line enhancement program in Minneapolis. The purpose of this program was to replace worn rail components and update and improve the rail signal system. In 2022, Transit expects to perform similar work between the Mall of America and Humphrey Station. Other work identified in our long range forecast for blue line enhancements includes improving track signals and track work at 32nd and 46th Street interlockings and signal upgrades between Cedar Riverside Station and Fort Snelling Station. The project we are speaking of today concentrates on certain areas around the mall that are worn to a point that they need to be replaced this year ahead of our 2022 construction project. Tom is here to explain the project. Tom. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee, and thank you for allowing us to present about the uh, Mall of America curb replacement contract, 18P389 today. Uh, I am Tom McGannon, project manager in the Metro Transit Engineering and Facility Department and the project manager of the uh, Mall of America curb replacement project. Today, I'll present the business item 2019 Dash 56 to request uh, the Metro Council uh, to authorize the regional administrator to award and execute the construction contract for the Mall of America curb replacement with RailWorks track systems in the amount of 2.88 million. The two stars on the map represent the two areas where we're having uh, the, this project take place. 28th Avenue is on the right side, and that's where we're replacing the, replacing the castings. And at the Mall of America, that's a star on the left, a little bit lower. That's where we're replacing the rail, some castings, and uh, moving a bump post. So this is an asset protection project that will, that will replace the Mall of America replace the rail at the Mall of America, replace the crossover castings at the Mall of America in 28th, re relocate the bump posts at the Mall of America, and this will begin May 31st, 2019 through June 10th of 2019. Uh, first, I'll discuss the rail replacement portion of the project at the Mall of America. Uh, Metro Transit will replace the worn curb rail at the Mall of America the replaced rail is located just south of the station platform, and that's where it says curved rail pointing up, and that's just south of the station platform. Then it comes down and curves uh, through the east side parking lot. The portion of the project and that is important because the section of the track is heavily used and needs to be replaced. The curve entering the Mall of America is the tightest on the light rail system, 
and the crossovers are used every time a train enters on track two and leaves on track one. In addition, the projected ridership is higher than expected. The result is the rail in the curve has been worn sooner than expected, and this rail now needs to be replaced. Uh, part of the project, Metro Transit is installing additional rail lubricators to reduce the amount of rail wear and extend the life of the new rail. The second portion of the project is to replace the crossover castings at the Mall of America in 28th. This part of the project will replace the worn out crossover castings at the Mall of America in 28th Avenue. The crossover castings, also called, called the point of switch, is a part of the rail that moves to enable trains to move or transfer from one track to the other. In fact, it's the only part of the track that moves. So in the first picture, you can see that's where the rail, or the rail kind of veers over to the left. Um, crossover castings are repaired by maintenance, rail maintenance, until they can't repair it anymore, and this needs to be replaced. Uh, these crossover castings on slide two had been repaired to the point that the bolts and the plates of the castings could no longer be repaired and needed to replace. This is a, one of the castings that had been done in the past, and that's a crossover casting replacement project. That's one of the pictures of the replacement. The last portion of the project is to re relocate the bump post to increase stopping distance for trains at the Mall of America. Now, bump posts are, uh, there's two bump posts, one on each track. It is precautionary measure to stop trains at the end of the line in the event that trains cannot stop normally. Now for operational considerations, there are three operational considerations for the project, which involved construction schedule, shutdown dates, and bus bridging to replace the trains during the shutdown. The goal of the construction schedule at the Mall of America is to plan for the least amount of disruptions for LRT, Mall of America, and special events, <coughs> which include concerts, games, parades, and so forth. When it is communicated to the rail operations at Metro Transit that a shutdown is, is required to complete the project, the construction schedule is planned, coordinated by rail operations, maintenance and other construction projects in the area. And then during the shutdown, buses will replace trains and this is called the bus bridge. So the proposed shutdown dates for this project is, is Friday, May 31st at 8 a.m. to Monday, June 10th at uh, 3 a.m. The first weekend uh, shutdown is proposed to start Friday, May 31st through Monday, June 3rd of 2019. The rail shutdown and bus bridge area will allow or will occur from Fort Snelling to the Mall of America. There are three Metro Transit Air, or there are several Metro Transit and Metropolitan Airport Commission construction projects planned during the first weekend of the shutdown. First, there's a mail, rail maintenance that will, will repair rail breaks between 28th and Fort Snelling. There's tunnel grouting project that will repair leaking areas in the MAC tunnel. Verizon will be down there adding additional antennas in the MAC tunnel. MAC will be down at the uh, in Humphrey and Lindbergh to repair and replace or repair and service <coughs> escalators and elevators around the rail platform areas. And this project will start at 28th replacing the castings, and we'll also start at the Mall of America uh, finishing the project. So from Monday, June 3rd to Monday, June 10th will be the second part of this project, and it will occur from 28th Avenue 
to the Mall of America, and trains will stop between 28th and the station, um, and that's where the bus bridge is going to be. So there's no additional um, project scheduled at that time down at the mall. Uh, nearly 80% of the funding on this project is scheduled to be from federal grants for rail replacement. 20% uh, would be from local funds. The total project budget is estimated at $3.786 million. The rail purchase and casting purchases have already been completed. Uh, the rail and castings were purchased in November because they have long lead items for manufacturing and Metro Transit had to schedule the construction of this project early spring to reduce um, disruptions. And the cost of the rail purchase was 160,000 and castings were 409,000. Uh, the construction bid process was followed on this project. The procurement steps included an invitation for bid on January 17th of 2019. February 15th of 2019, two bids were received and opened publicly. Railworks track systems provided the low responsible, responsible and responsive bid of 2.88 million. The Office of Equal Opportunity evaluated the Railworks uh, bid and determined that the DBE participation goal for the project would be met. Engineering and Facilities Department determined that the low bid submitted by Railworks was fair and reasonable and in the best interest of the Met Council. Metro, Metro Transit requests that Metro Met Council authorize the Regional Administrator to award and execute construction contract number 18P389 with Railworks track systems in the amount of $2.88 million. Thank you for your time, and please let me know if I can answer any questions. Thank you very much. Is there any questions for the presenter? Council Member Cummings. Thank you, Chairwoman. Uh, is two bids what you would expect on a project like this? To get uh, sometimes there's longer or more, but around here, yes. Thank you. Any other questions? Council Member Sterner. It just, it seemed like the bidding uh, time was a, a short period of time and you sometimes extend that to encourage more bids, uh, get more time uh, to bid and, and project. Uh, There's just not that many bidders around here in this area. We could extend it, but in terms of federally, the window, we've met that. And chair committee members, um, yeah, there's, there's a selected few capable contractors that are able to bid some of these projects because they're so detailed and technical. And our market's very, very small in comparison to the East Coast type of markets. So uh, we do get in contact with the firms that we know that are able to do this work and we let them know that it's coming. And the time frame for bidding is appropriate for the scope of work that we have. Okay, all right, thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Um, I have a comment, a couple of questions. Um, first of all, I'm really glad to hear you're aligning these projects with all the other activities. It's nice to minimize disruptions, especially on the stretch between the, the mall and the airport. I really appreciate the foresight with that. Um, one question I had um, was you had mentioned that something that it was shorter than the initial life of what you thought it would be for the rail. Um, how long is that? How much shorter was it, I guess? Uh, Madam Chair and the committee members, uh... Let's see, 2004 to now. Um, normally, it's they they want it to go about 30 years. Okay. Thank uh, you. That helps for future planning. Yes. And chair, committee members, uh, some of our again, the higher wear areas, the switches, the type of things that move, we get a lot of contact with our our uh, rail uh, cars. I uh, do get worn out faster, and then. Again, we have uh, um, regarding the program as the technology, end. but for this, it's, it is uh, the components that are worn out. We have those curves that wear out, mm -hmm. and for this type of repairs, that's typical for those type of components. Great. 
Thank you. Um, my last question is actually probably for General Manager Coistro. Um, last time when we had to shut down in downtown for the crossover casting replacements, um, we had it was we had a big communication program letting people know in advance. Um, do we know yet what we have planned to let our customers know? Uh, I haven't, uh, Chair Barbara. I haven't, I haven't seen the communications okay. plan, but I will I will share that once once we have it. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, any other questions? All right, um, uh, post action was on the screen, or was on the screen, disappeared quickly. Um, uh, so with that, I'd entertain a motion to approve. Motion to approve. Okay, uh, we have a motion, is there a second? All second. All right, any other discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed nay, and the motion carries. <clears throat> Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so that concludes our business for today. So the next thing we do is determine what goes on consent and what doesn't to the full council. So um, anything that's marked with the same week item typically proceeds directly to council, um, not on consent. So the first item would be um, on the non-consent agenda. Um, I would propose that item two go on consent and item three be non-consent. Does anyone have any thoughts or? Are we good with that? Okay. All right. There you go. All right. So now we will move on to our information um, um, section. We've got uh, Director Thompson here for, for start our orientation. And please uh, do ask questions throughout. I think it's really important for you guys to interact and um, yeah, get as much out of this session as we can. Madam Chair and members, let me just give you a briefly introduction here, uh, how we're going to go about this. We've divided it up into our three major areas of, mm -hmm. of the MTS division, um, and we're asking our leaders of each of those divisions to give a presentation. We're also going to give you a kind of a regional ridership overview that comes before this committee every quarter, and we thought we'd give you just some background performance data on ridership for the different systems that uh, our council and the region are responsible for. Um, and I encourage you, we, we have a lot of information here before you, I encourage you to ask questions, but also wanted to put uh, faces, to, names and faces in front of you. So these are people you can follow up and ask for individual briefings or anything you would like over the coming months to get, get up to speed. There's a couple items in here that are gonna go before the full council that we felt, we'll just touch on, but we felt that it's important to go deeper with you and all the council members. That would be our transportation policy plan. I believe you're going to get full updates on all the policy plans eventually this spring. Another item is the Metro Mobility System. We'll talk about that tonight, but that is something you're going to hear a lot from, from your constituents in your area that are users of Metro Mobility, and it's, it's a very um, complicated system, and we want to really get in deep about how it works, but not just for the Transportation Committee, but for the full council, because it's something you'll hear a lot about. So we want to get in. So that'll be at an upcoming meeting. And tonight we're going to touch on the transportation budget, uh, both from MTS and Metro Transit, but I believe you have a council budget briefing this week. We're, we're just going to focus a little deeper on the transportation budget. And that is always presented both from MTS and Metro Transit, so uh, both are presenting tonight. And so what we'll start off with is our planning, then we'll go on to contract and transit, then budget. And leading off is our <coughs> director of planning, Amy Venomitz, and with her is Cole Nick. Thank you. Madam Chair and members, as Nick said, I'm Amy Venowitz. I'm the Deputy Director of MTS and I lead the long range transportation planning. And then I also have finance in my title. And I like to say, when, I, when we say finance, we're not talking about budgets, we're talking about how are we gonna pay for things in our transportation system that we wanna do in the region. So it's very high level um, finance. So I get, the dubious distinction of being the first overview that you're receiving. And um, some of the times I'm gonna be going through these slides pretty quickly because some of these things you've heard quite a bit already, um, but do not hesitate to stop me, ask me to back up, give more detail in areas that you're particularly interested in. So as you've heard, the council has two primary roles in transportation. The first is planning, very high level regional systems planning for all modes. And we conduct that planning both under federal and state 
law. And then um, we also do transit operations. And as I was sitting here listening to the business items today and then knowing we were following up with this overview, I thought this is a perfect example of a committee meeting where you as members have to move from big, high level policy, why, why do we want to do things to, oh, here's a specific project and I need to approve a contract to, um, I didn't pay that much attention by, <laughs> by, by something. <laughs> So, um, but I think I, it, it's kind of an interesting combination of being able to talk about where do we want to go as a region? How do we think about the region? How do we think about transportation? And how do we implement it? How do we pay for things? What are the funding sources? What are the projects that we need to implement? And so you're going to have that today, obviously, but probably almost every meeting you will have as the transportation committee you'll have a little bit of that contrast of seeing things at the high regional level and the specific implementation level. For MTS, Metropolitan Transportation Services, um, led by Nick, you really get that. So MTS, as Nick said, we have about 50 people, a little over. Uh, half of us do regional planning, the high level planning and half of the staff in MTS do transit operations, metro mobility, van pool, contracted transit services. So um, even in our day-to-day -day lives, our one unit at the council has both the high and uh, specific project level type of activity going on. So today I'm gonna talk to you about our transportation planning work specifically. We have about 20 transportation <coughs> planners in MTS. Most of us have a background in um, urban planning, uh, policy planning, uh, civil engineering, geographic information systems, data analysis, those types of backgrounds. We break our transportation planners into four groups of people, four units, led by a planning manager. So uh, our first group, our highway planning group, is led by Steve Peterson, who is lucky enough to be on spring break today. So you'll meet him for sure at a later date. And then Steve leads highway planning, and he also works on leading the activities of our transportation advisory board, along with Elaine Kotsukos, who is the TAB coordinator. And so Steve, you will see related to regional solicitation and the allocation of our federal funds. We have with us Cole Hineker, who will give part of the presentation today. And Cole leads our transit, bike and pedestrian planning group of um, people who specialize in that modal planning. We have Jonathan Ehrlich with us today. Jonathan is here. Um, Jonathan leads uh, the part of our transportation planning work that deals with travel surveying, our transportation model, and r other research work that we do. Um, Jonathan's work includes something called the Travel Behavior Inventory, where we sur uh, survey people throughout households throughout the region on how they travel. That is ongoing um, now, but we're not going to talk about that one today. You'll get a more in-depth a description of what that work is at a later date from Jonathan himself. And then we have Mark Philippi, who is way back there. And Mark uh, leads the group of planners that oversees our congestion management process. That's a federally required process to reduce congestion from different methods in our region. And he also leads uh, the review of any local planning amendments and comprehensive plans that are done, and also our aviation work, which even in our group, aviation is a little bit of an outlier of what we do. So that is our group of planners. And um, I really encourage you to contact the planners and the managers. They are the experts in the various modes and activities that we're conducting. And they're the people who can help you with any questions and specific questions things that you might need to know. Uh, I'm a generalist, so um, so uh, moving forward, I'm going to move through a lot of this information pretty quickly. 
So our transportation planning requirements, we do transportation planning under requirements that are in both state and federal law, and I'm going to talk about each of those a little bit separately. Our state transportation planning, at the state level, we are required to produce a regional development guide, Thrive MSP 2040, which I'm sure you've heard about, probably started to read even. Um, and then we produce policy plans, system plans that are meant to implement the guide. In transportation, we have two of those system plans. We have surface transportation and aviation. The other two regional plans are wastewater and parks, and you would hear about those in, under a different committee. So the primary role of the system plans is to provide, and this is under state law, is to provide guidance to local governments regarding how the regional systems are going to develop, how are we going to invest in those regional systems, and what should the local communities plan for and expect out of their regional systems. So that is our state law, and this graphic is meant to depict how that happens over a period of time. We start essentially in looking at the current process. We started in 2014 with the adoption of the Regional Development Guide Thrive. We did updates to the system plans, the transportation plan included there between 2014 and 2015. Then we send system statements to all of the local governments in the region and those statements attend essentially tell them, here's what you should expect out of your transportation system. Here's what you have in your area. Here are the highways that are in your community. Here are the transit services that we run in your community. And here's how they're gonna change over the next 20 years. And then the local communities take that information and along with their own local road information and other transportation that they control and they produce a local plan, then they send it back to us. And that's the process we're in right now where we review the local plans and we decide is what they're saying about what's going to happen in their community consistent with what we have in the transportation policy plan with our goals and objectives and strategies? And does it conform? Does it reflect what we have told them is going to happen on the regional system? So an extreme example might be if we tell you uh, as a community that you have a, a, a freeway in your community, it runs right through the middle of your community and you need to show that on every map of your community and then we get the plan back and they didn't show any of the freeways on the maps, we would call that nonconformance and we would send a letter back to the community and say, no, you are not reflecting the regional system in the way we told you to do that as part of the system plan. So that is the, ser and then hopefully they change their plan and incorporate the regional system as we've advised. So that is the state planning process and um, the local plans were all due December 31st. A lot of them came in, a lot of them have extensions and will be coming over the next year. And so for those of you who also sit on the Community Development Committee, you'll hear quite a bit more about how that review process actually happens. So in state law, we also have a requirement that we have a Transportation Advisory Board or TAB. The TAB, uh, despite what it says here, only has 34 members, not 35. Um, so I apologize for that error. Uh, and it is the membership of TAB is specified in state law. It includes a majority of local elected officials and also citizen members appointed by the council and members that represent the state agencies. Under a long standing agreement between the council and the TAB, the TAB is given a primary responsibility for running our regional solicitation, the process that allocates a hundred million dollars of federal funds throughout the region every two years. And while they run that process, the council is still responsible for approving the projects that are selected through that process. And the council can either approve the entire program of projects 
or it can send the program of projects back to the tab with a recommendation that they reconsider something within that recommended program of projects. Um, Council Member Fredson. Thank you, Chair. Um, could you tell me when, when was the tab created and as far as its composition, has that always been the same over time or have there been adjustments over time? Uh, Madam Chair and Council Member Fredson. Fredson. Yeah. Um, yes, so the tab was put in originally in state law when the council was formed and had a planning requirement, but it did not include the membership. Um, at that point in time, the language simply read that the council shall have an advisory body that assists it with regional transportation planning. And in the early 90s, I should, I should have, my previous role, I worked at the Minnesota Senate for many years, and I remember working on this legislation. Um, but there was some, the, the membership of the tab had kind of been longstanding. And then, um, but there was some consternation that at some point it might change and was they wanted it to be more specific. So it was put into state law in the early 1990s and the specific membership spelled out. Over time, there have been a couple changes related to appointing modal representatives, which are required for MPOs um, under federal law, and also to include representation of the uh, suburban transit providers. And that was just recent. I think that was within the last two to three years that that was passed. Um, Madam Chair, yeah. members, also the, some of the citizen membership positions are open now and are accepting applications, and you'll be asked. Some of you'll be asked to be part of the selection on that yeah. later. And if you know people, the application process is open through March 29th, and it's available online, so we can get you that link too. All right, Dean. Uh, Madam Chair, members, uh, continuing on, the TAB also has a Technical Advisory Committee, the TAC. The TAC is made up of technical staff, primarily engineers and planners, from the seven counties, 12 cities, um, uh, 11 state and regional agencies, and then we also, and I'll explain this later, have one representative from Wright and Sherburne County area. The Technical Advisory Committee, everything that the tab C moves first through the TAC and they give a technical recommendation to TAB. There are times where things are really policy questions. And at that point in time, the TAC will advise TAB, we think this is a policy issue and uh, we can give you these facts about it, but the decision and recommendation really needs to come from the policymakers, not from the Technical Advisory Committee. So under federal transportation law, um, you have already heard this last Wednesday and I'm gonna go into a little bit more detail, um, but what is a metropolitan planning organization? I'm guessing many of you have already heard that there's a little bit of controversy surrounding the council in its role as the MPO and all, all explain that a little bit, um, but MPOs are required under federal law. Every urbanized area that has a population greater than 50,000 in population has to form an MPO to do transportation planning. In urbanized areas that have over 200,000 in population, the MPO is also known as a transportation management area or TMA. And those areas are the ones that directly receive federal funds. So in our case, the $100 million that we allocate through the regional solicitation, we receive because we are a, both an MPO and a TMA under federal law. So MPOs, the primary purpose of an MPO is to carry out what is known as the 3C planning process, cooperative, comprehensive, and continuing, continuing you will learn, it is very, it goes on and on. Um, so that is really, we are carrying out a process and the intent is to involve agencies, local government, the general public 
people throughout the region. And while we run that process, we're not necessarily completely in charge of it because it's a cooperative process. Under federal law, we also have some planning products, including the long range plan that we have to produce and we'll go through those. Um, and we have to make sure our process provides opportunities for public participation. That is a cornerstone of the federal law. So in our region, as I said, the council is the MPO. We have been the MPO and designated as the MPO since 1973 when we were designated by then Wendell Anderson in response to a federal requirement to have an MPO. In 1991, the federal law was specifically changed to require that MPOs have a certain membership makeup and that makeup includes local elected officials, representatives, and then also some modal and agency representatives. However, in 1991, when the federal law was changed to require that membership, it also grandfathered in any MP MPO that was already designated and in existence. And it grandfathered in those MPOs, provided the structure and organization of that MPO did not substantially change. And if, it if and when it substantially changed, then that area would be required to designate a new MPO. So that grandfathering clause is still in federal law. The council is, as I said, been the MPO since 1973. And it, a few years ago, we had some of the suburban counties who questioned that and said, why is the council the MPO? And they asked the US DOT to affirm or um, deny that the council was the MPO. And on three occasions in the recent years anyway, in 2011, 2015, and 2016, we have received affirmation from various levels of the US DOT that the council is in fact the MPO. We still are the MPO. We qualify under the grandfathering provision in federal law and that the changes that have occurred since 1991 to our structure and organization are not significant enough where we would have, have, have had to redesignate as the MPO. So that's kind of a big thing that's been happening over the last few years. And I think um, given the last three affirmations that we feel pretty confident that that is something that un unless the structure of the council significantly changes, we will remain as the MPO. Um, we act as the MPO under a memorandum of understanding with MnDOT, and that is required under federal law too. Under most regions, they would have a memorandum of understanding that also includes the major transit operator, but because we are also the transit operator, the council serves in that role too. So our memorandum of understanding is just between MnDOT and the council but it talks about a process that we will jointly run that includes many other entities listed here and also includes the public. So another surprising thing that you will learn is that MPOs, um, as I said, are designated under federal law and you have MPOs represent urbanized areas. So the federal government declares what is an urbanized area. Prior to 2010, our urbanized area was shown in the blue here and it was contained entirely within the seven county area. But in 20, after the 2010 census, when they looked at urbanized area again, we discovered that our urbanized area is beginning to grow outside of the seven county region. Specifically, uh, it now includes the cities of St. Michael, Albertville, Hanover, Otsego, and Elk River. So those five cities are in Sherburne and Wright counties. And because they are urbanized, that those areas are required 
to be under the purview of the council in its role as the MPO. So as a transportation planning entity, we now include those areas in our transportation planning work and our TIP, any federal money that is spent in those areas is included in our TIP. So um, that was a fairly recent change. We also have an MOU in place with Wright and Sherburn counties talking about how we will do transportation planning in those designated urban areas and how any projects they select for funding will be reflected in our TIP. So that is a role the council has as an MPO that is different than any of the other functions. The other functions of the council, land use planning, reviewing the local plans, wastewater, transit operations, do not apply in those areas. Mm. So, um, One moment, uh, Director Thompson. On that uh, point, we usually invite uh, the council member from District 1 and 9 to a meeting once a year with uh, those in the 7W region. So we'll be scheduling that and we invite the chair of the transportation too. And that's part of the agreement that we do an annual coordination on that event. So um, we're looking at in the May timeframe for that meeting to occur this time. Thank you. Uh, council member Kynes. Can you just once again say the sentence? St. Michael, Albertville, Otsego. What are the other two? Um, Hanover. Hanover. Um, St. Michael, Albertville, Otsego, Elk River. Thank you. And I, technically Elk River Township too. Thank you. So um, moving on, this next graphic is in our transportation policy plan and it is meant to give kind of a look a little bit at how planning is a continuous process and how we interact with other planning work that is being done. So under number one, we have the big regional plans, Thrive MSP 2040. We have Minnesota Go statewide transportation plan produced by MnDOT. Uh, and then we have our system plans such as the transportation policy plan. All of those plans provide us with an investment direction and we make investment decisions those investment decisions in the metro area are reflected in our transportation improvement program or TIP, which you did amend today for one project. Um, and then we implement the projects in the TIP and we ask ourselves, how, how did they do? How did they perform? What results did we get from those projects? And we think about our investment strategy again and we go back to the planning process and we tweak our plans, we tweak our strategies, we tweak our goals, we invest again, and we are in this continuous process of thinking about how we wanna invest, <coughs> investing, reviewing our investments, and then going back to the start. Um, so the products that we here at the council are specifically in charge of as part of that planning process, the transportation policy plan is really the primary document that my group of planners helps you and the region produce. The TPP covers a 20 year period, um, talks about investing over 20 years, but in the earlier years is a lot more specific about the types of investments we would like to see in the region. Those investments are then put into the transportation improvement program which is a four-year program of projects that have funding allocated to them. And we, within the TIP, specify how much funding and from what sources. And then um, the Unified Planning Work Program is an annual program of planning work and part of that process of reviewing our investments and our performance and our outcomes that we do jointly with MnDOT uh, and Metro Transit. It's annual planning work that then feeds back into our 20 year transportation policy plan. So uh, our products are influenced by products produced by others uh, and also state and federal law. Uh, it's influenced by Thrive MSP 2040 and demographic trends and 
characteristics of the region that are changing over time. And then, as I said earlier, the statewide planning work of MnDOT influences our plans and processes, and then the annual studies that we do, which um, Cole will fill you in on a couple things that we've been doing in, uh, our, in the highway and transit areas too. So the TPP, as I said, really is our premier document. We just adopted it in um, October of 2015. Previously, we were doing it under a four-year cycle. So every four years, we update the TPP. Because we are coming into air quality attainment, we are under a new federal requirement where we can now update it every five years. So the next cycle of updating the transportation policy plan, will ha ha it will have to be adopted within five years, but as you'll see, we'll start working on it probably two years prior to that, because it's about a two year process to update the plan and fully adopt it. The plan under federal law must be fiscally constrained. And that is a really important piece of the federal law. A lot of times people think of plans as being a little bit utopian and out there and, oh, here's where we want to go 30, 20, 30 years from now. But the transportation policy plan is realistic above all else because we are required to look at how much money do we reasonably think we're going to have under state and federal law and past practices and reasonable assumptions about changes to state and federal law. And so, and then we are obligated to take that estimate of revenue and talk about how we want it spent within the region. So many years ago, we did not have this requirement of fiscal constraint, and we routinely had long-range plans that would have huge expansion projects all over the region um, that we were never going to do. We were never going to be able to afford them. We were never going to get to them. And we weren't the only region doing that. Other regions were doing that. And that's why the feds came back in and changed the law and said, your long-range plans have to be realistic. You have to tell your local governments and the public what you're really going to do, not what you dream about doing and that you can never afford to do. You tell them what is really going to happen with the transportation system. And so um, that, that concept of being more of an investment plan is really where the transportation policy plan is it's we look at revenues and we talk about how we're going to invest those revenues within our region. Our plan covers all modes, um, but because the highway and transit systems are the big regional systems, we are focused much more heavily on those two systems. How are we going to invest in the highway system? How are we going to invest in the regional transit system? And um, for highways, that primarily means what we call our principal arterials and our minor arterials. A principal arterial is usually owned by MnDOT. It would be a freeway or an expressway. All of the interstates are principal arterials and also roads like Trunk Highway 169, Trunk Highway 62, those are also designated as principal arterials, Trunk Highway 65 going north. Minor arterials, 70% um, of them are owned by counties, so they are more part of the local system. MnDOT does have 20% of our minor arterials and cities have 10%. A minor arterial might be Snelling Avenue in St. Paul. It might be Highway 5 in Chanhassen. Trunk Highway 95 in Washington County, those are all minor arterials in the region. And that those are the level of roads that our TPP is focused on. The TPP is also focused on our bus and rail transitways, where the transitways are located, what the mode will be, how we will pay for them. 
And for the bus system, the TPP focuses at a high level of how do we want to invest in the bus system, but not route specific. So a uh, question, if you haven't looked forward in the, does anyone have a good concept of how much money we spend annually on transportation in our region? <coughs> Even a range. Well, I'll, on this next slide, the next two slides show revenue and spending within our region. So in 2018, the annual spending, and this is at all levels of government, so township, city, county, region, MnDOT, all together, $2.9 billion is about what we're spending on an annual basis. And if you look over 20 years, we will have nearing almost $100 million that will be spent on transportation purposes within our region. And um, when you look at these pies for the revenue sources, what you'll see is that we get transportation revenue from a lot of different sources. And again, they are sources at the federal level. We have federal gas tax. <laughs> state level, we have state gas tax, state registration tax, state motor vehicle sales tax. And then at the local level, we have property taxes, which are by and far the biggest con single contributor to transportation revenues. We have local sales taxes, um, and we have things like fares on our transit system that are local revenues. So um, how do we spend all of that revenue? I'm not gonna go into detail on this, but this next slide really shows, um, again, that that revenues get spent really in three areas, transit, state highways, and then our local road and bike and ped systems. And um, what you'll see is transit sometimes is a bigger piece of the pie than people are expecting. And I like to remind people that transit is a little bit different in that the public sector pays 100% of the cost of transit. So capital and operating, we pay for the insurance, we pay for the gas, we pay for operating the system. Whereas when you look at something like state highways, they do operate the system, they plow and mow but it's not the same as operating a vehicle on the system. Many of the operating costs of our roadway systems are private costs. You and I pay for insurance, we pay for gas, we pay to buy our vehicle. So a lot of those costs, which are also part of the spending that occurs in our region are not shown on these pie charts. And that is why, because transit, both um, capital and operating are publicly born sometimes is a little bit higher than people were expecting. Uh, the tip, I'm not going to go into this in any detail since you did uh, today get a PowerPoint from Joe and adopt an amendment to the tip and you will see quite a few more of those in your days moving forward. Regional solicitation, we will give you a full presentation on this process and how it comes about. As I said before, we do allocate about 100 million every, we have 100 million every year. We allocate it every two years. So we allocate 200 million at a time. The last solicitation was just adopted in January and that was for funding that will come to the region in 2022 and 2023. And now we're gonna start the process for the next solicitation and that will allocate money in 20, for 2024 and 2025. Um, and you will hear over time a lot about that process <coughs> and how it might or might not change into the future. Um, last slide for me is again, keeping in mind that public participation is really a cornerstone of what we do in transportation planning. We have partnerships with MnDOT and other agencies with our local governments, but we want and need to run processes that also invite the public in to participate as possible. And um, 
that is where I will stop and take any questions and turn it over to Cole. Council Member Atlas Ingebrigtsen. Thank you, Chair. Um, I was wondering if you could provide some examples of the bike and pedestrian investments um, that are that are a part of our transportation um, supports. In particular, I know that for a lot of our populations that are do live without a car, rely on um, bus transit and light rail to get around, but then they're also walking or biking to that or um, from that locations. And since 2009, we've seen a trend upward in pedestrian deaths in particular, but this year in particular, the highest yet. Um, and often pedestrian deaths just are something we don't really stop to think and talk about, um, although they outpace bicycle, bicycle deaths significantly. So just wondering, what are we doing to making around investments to making that safer or, or what are the types of investments that that we're doing in that space yeah i'm gonna let cole since uh, that area falls under the planning group he leads sure uh, madam chair uh, council member alice ingramson so this, in terms of the regional solicitation which amy just covered there is a specific category for pedestrian projects and that has typically actually focused on safety or ADA projects to try to improve you know, access for uh, bringing projects up to federal requirements or making them more safe. I think we funded three, two or three of those projects this last cycle of the regional solicitation. So we, and that decision about how much we fund is set in forth by TAP through an action. So they actually set the range for the amount of funding that we put towards those types of projects. There is much more funding on the bikes, but we, we actually fund trail projects there. So trail and bike projects would actually, in many cases, be multimodal. So both bikes and pedestrians can use those facilities. I think we had, I want to say over 50 requests for projects in that category this cycle. I don't know how many we funded, but we did fund quite a bit because that was a, our highest requesting category in terms of number of projects. Um, so that is typically a fairly high number of projects that we fund out of the regional solicitation. I'll go into how we help guide planning for those elements on the regional scale, but most of those projects are local projects. And so there, our main interaction with them is through the regional solicitation or just at a very high level, giving them guidance on how they should be doing bike and ped planning. Um, one note that during the regional solicitation, the criteria that we use on a technical level factors in things like we want to invest in locations that are near transit service. And so that is one of our criteria that we look to tr try to prioritize those investments above all others. And so that's, that's our primary role on the, on the, particularly on the pedestrian scale. As I said, on bike, on bike planning, we do more regional planning and I'll actually cover a little bit of that in the presentation today. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Well, I do get to talk about some fun stuff. So, uh, not that Amy's stuff wasn't fun, but, um, you know, in terms of current transportation planning issues, and I want to just note that this is, this is a re reflective of what we've heard during our planning process and developing the TPP and from our partners, and this is focused primarily on transportation planning. So, things that are at the scale Amy was talking about, the TPP level, those high-level issues. Um, Amy covered MPO governance and structure. I don't want to talk about that too much. On the Metro Highway side, uh, one of the emerging issues that we're talking about more is our funding allocation. And when I say that, I, I primarily mean across the state of Minnesota. Um, we have requirements under federal law to become more performance-based in our planning. And part of what that does is it focuses us to be data-driven in how we allocate resources across the state. And in many cases, uh, we're allocating more resources to areas outside of the metro area because they have pavement that's maybe in worse condition or they have higher amounts of pavement throughout greater Minnesota. So it's not necessarily based on the number of users, it's just based on the pavement that's out there and the quality of that pavement. And so the focus and the funding has been to shift to the performance-based metrics, which then allocates more money to the areas that have worse pavement. Um, that goes against some of the history of, of the state and region to actually allocate a very specific percentage, which Amy probably knows off the top of her head. 30. 2.6? Yeah, 42.6 <laughs> to the metro area from statewide uh, highway funding. And so um, when you start doing performance-based um, uh, performance based planning, it starts to bring that number into challenge based on your metrics. So that's one issue that we're facing. 
Um, we also, when we look at corridor investment alternatives for, for highways, I'm going to talk about a framework that we look at highway investments in. Um, but there are, there are questions about how do, we, how do we invest in those corridors? What are the different alternatives we should be looking at? Um, we often, when we look at our hierarchy of mobility, we look for um, very easy technology solutions first. Then we look for lower cost, high benefit projects. Um, and then we go to MinPass and we, we look at all of those options before we decide to expand the freeway for general purpose. And so in, in some cases that, that process is, is brought into question um, by various levels. Um, we also have a lot of equity and community con considerations for our investments. Um, so the, the project mentioned here, Rethinking I-94, this is really a huge opportunity for the region. Um, it's already undergone some study and they're in phase two of that analysis. It's an opportunity for us to make amends of, of some decisions that were really disruptive to our com community in the past. And so we recognize that as we have a very mature highway system, there's going to be a lot more opportunities to rebuild the highway system that's already there and look for those, those opportunities to change the way that system passes through communities, particularly communi communities that were um, split up when the highway was put in. And so that's the, really our first major opportunity in this region to have that conversation. We also, as you already heard, we talked about geographic balance. Sometimes you hear it referred to as regional balance, and that's really just how are revenues and projects distributed across the region? Does everyone get their fair share? And actually, we have a number of presentations at some point, we should probably bring back to you, that show you can look at geography and how resources are allocated in a lot of different ways. And you can look at it by population weight. You can look at it by just geography in general. You can look at it by administrative boundaries like county or city or council districts. And so it's a very complex question, and it's brought up on almost every project that we work on about how our, um, how our resources are distributed in this region. Uh, on the bus side, uh, there are going to be a number of, of fairly significant studies coming to this council in the next year or two. Uh, we are, we do, as you know, we have our first arterial bus rapid transit line open in the A line. Uh, there's a number of other projects in development, but there's more planning to be done for what projects come down the line. So we have uh, three actively in development, and we're looking at what's the next phases after that, and, and do we have our priorities right? Um, our big topic recently has been about automated, connected, and electric vehicles. Um, all of those are different challenges for us in the region moving forward in terms of our infrastructure and how our system is used. There are also uh, opportunities there for us to, to look at how the system could be different. And so we are actually partnering with MnDOT to look at, uh, do some high-level workshops of which we had one round of those earlier this year, but we're really just starting the conversation about what does the future look like? What alternative futures should we be looking at? And what could we expect under those different futures with autonomous and connected vehicles? And, and electric is a piece of that as well. And then the last one that we heard a lot about during our last TPP, shared mobility. Um, you know, actually when we developed the TPP in 2015, Uber and Lyft were actually relatively new. so. We tried to do it uh, a little bit faster. We tried to look at what, what was going on in that space, and we, we don't really have a whole lot to say in our plan at this time, but we're working on um, having conversations around that area moving forward. So some of the reasons, some of the ways we get around those tough issues is we do planning studies. And they really provide us with a dive deep into some issues, um, subsets of the transportation system. And this is often where a lot of the prioritization of our infrastructure or our investments occurs. And it's where a lot of the technical analysis occurs is during the study phase, not necessarily when we're developing the plan. Um, a couple of example studies we've done, we, we do studies to, to prioritize where MinPass is being allocated throughout the region. Uh, we also have looked at uh, which freeway system interchanges we need to improve in the near term. Um, we did a re regional bicycle barriers study. Um, so that's one example of a study that we did on a regional level to look at where bicycle barriers are and how local governments can help us overcome them as a region. Uh, once the studies are completed, the results are generally incorporated into the plan either through our prioritization of investments, through our strategies, or in some cases to help direct other programs like the regional solicitation. This map here is from a, a highway bus rapid transit study that looked at different station areas in a corridor and looked at which ones have the highest potential for, for ridership. And so that's, you see the different scale colors there. Just gives you a sense for what types of things we produce in those studies. 
On the highway investment direction side, um, really when we have limited funding as we've had for quite a while on the highway side, we need to prioritize our needs and uh, we have huge needs as well. And so we invest strategically in highways, um, focusing on affordable, multimodal and flexible solutions. We're really looking at solving the existing problems first and, and trying to get um, look at proactively towards the future to the best that we can. Um, one thing that, just noting, you know, we're the 16th largest metro area in the country. Can you think of any large metro areas that are larger than us that don't have congestion? I, I'm guessing not. And, and that's something, something that we try to tell people. It's a reality of being a large, um, a very large economy in a very large region with a lot of people, and we're going to grow, is that we know that congestion is a reality in our system, but our plan focuses on trying to manage and optimize it to the greatest extent possible. And when we do that, we try to look to provide options for people to avoid congestion or have a more reliable trip. And to the best extent we can pro provide more uh, capacity in the system when we're also in doing other projects. And so the example here on the screen, I-35E Min Pass was actually built as that freeway segment was being reconstructed. And so we were able to do both maintenance and expansion at the same time. And here's the, the hierarchy of regional mobility on the highway side that I spoke about. So again, looking at technology first. Um, if if um, other solutions are needed, we go to spot mobility. And those are often called uh, high benefit, low cost projects. Uh, we actually have a list in the transportation policy plan called CMSP or congestion mitigation and safety projects. Um, and that list is where we use to, to help prioritize where these investments and opportunities exist in the region. And, if we get highway funding, sometimes we go to that, that list to find the highest needs uh, that we have in the region upcoming to, to fund. Uh, third option would be MinPass. And again, uh, we have a list in the TPP, and I'll actually show you the maps for where those corridors are planned in our, in our region. And then the final option is strategic capacity. And we usually only go to that option when all the other options are infeasible or don't provide benefit that's um, equivalent to the cost that we, we look for. So here is the MinPass investment scenarios in the TPP. Um, we, we do have, as Amy said, a fiscally constrained plan. So the map on the left is what is in our fiscally constrained plan within the resources we have. Uh, the increased revenue on the right side would be projects that we, we think show good potential, but would only be able to be built if additional funding were to become available. Um, I would note on this map, the dark blue lines are the existing MinPass, uh, the light blue lines are the plant in pass in the current revenue scenario. I think I-35W North of uh, Highway 36 interchange is the next min pass to be uh, put under construction. I wanna say this year it starts. So that's the next major uh, min pass project you'll see constructed in the region. And 494 um, just near 35W is actually awarded funding out of quarters of commerce funding. So that's the next project that will occur after that. Um, in terms of transitways, just wanted to give you a little context for how does a transitway get into the plan. And again, transitways are things like bus rapid transit or light rail or commuter rail. Um, the first thing that usually occurs is that there's a, a locally preferred alternative that comes out of a local study process. And these are often led by counties, sometimes cities. Uh, Metro Transit has led a few of those studies in the past. And we asked the local government to document the process that they went through. And so again, a technical process with a lot of input from the public, but also from stakeholders along the corridor. Um, in order for us to, to, to make sure that we understand local governments are supportive of the line, we ask for local resolutions of support. Uh, our most recent uh, locally preferred alternative was the Riverview Modern Streetcar Project from downtown St. Paul to the airport in Mall of America. And so we, we asked for local resolutions of support from all the governments that the line passes through. And that allows us to have some certainty that the project will uh, be supported locally. We also ask for a timeline of the project so we know when they expect it to be constructed and open, and then a project financial plan so that we can demonstrate fiscal constraint of the project. Here is the current revenue scenario for the uh, transitway plan. Uh, this is all the funded corridors currently in the TPP, uh, up to date with the Riverview shown here, which was adopted actually just two weeks ago. Um, we have six light rail projects, one modern streetcar, one, uh, two highway BRTs, and a number of uh, dedicated BRTs in the plan. And so those are the majority of the projects in, um, 
that are not arterial BRT. We then also have one open arterial BRT project in the A line. Uh, the C line is uh, under construction and expected to open this year. So that'll be our second arterial bus rapid transit project. And then we have three corridors that are partially funded primarily with funds from the regional solicitation. So that's been a big source of funding for arterial bus rapid transit projects in the past. Um, and we are, uh, I think we have a request for a bonding uh, for to complete this the uh, D-line funding this year. And we're hopeful that we can get the, the full funding for that project secured. Here is the, um, the current revenue scenario for transitways as compared to the larger vision. And so you see a number of additional corridors on this map. Um, we've structured this so that you can understand the various stages of the corridors. And so increased revenue scenario projects, there are a number of them where an LPA recommendation has been made by a local government, but they haven't been able to show fiscal constraint yet. So they haven't shown us where they're gonna get the money to pay for the project. So one example of that would be um, the Nicollet Central Modern Streetcar in Minneapolis. They have uh, actually environmental work going on in that project, but they haven't identified the full slate of revenues needed to help make that project a reality. Uh, the last slide I have here is on regional bicycle planning. And so when we look at regional bicycle planning, our focus is primarily on providing a regional network for transportation purposes. Uh, so not necessarily for recreation, although they do overlap with our trail system in, in many ways. It's really looking at the backbone of our, of our transportation network for bicyclists that are, that are making uh, medium to, to longer trips on the network. Um, really looking at connecting activity centers and destinations throughout the region and then connections within the system. And we use this primarily to both guide local planners on where they should be prioritizing, uh, looking at bicycle infrastructure in their community. And so the requirement actually in our comprehensive plan planning process is that cities document where they have these corridors and alignments in their plan. Uh, but we also use this to prioritize regional solicitation funding. So if you are a bike project being proposed and you're on this system or you connect to it, you get more points, more likely to be awarded funding through our process. Um, we also uh, have done a bicycle barrier study, and that's again similar to this. It's a scale to help local planners understand where major barriers exist in the system and ways that they might be able to overcome them. And we do help maintain a regional bicycle inventory. So that's both uh, facilities that exist out there on street and off street, and just to help sure that we're making, uh, making sure that we're all working from the same data. So those are different ways of, I think when we go into more detail on the TPP at a future meeting, uh, you'll hear a lot more about what's in it, but I wanted to give you a high level summary of the investments that we have in there. And I uh, welcome any questions. Any questions from council members? I know it's a lot to take in, but they it will, you know, you've got the information and we can certainly circle back with questions. Uh, Council Member Fred. Thank you, Chair. Um, just on the uh, on the current revenue scenarios and then the increased revenue scenarios and then this last um, the, the second to last slide, which is this larger vision, is that increased revenue scenario? That's that's a like a third scenario or that's uh, I'm just trying to tell if this is more visionary or if, uh, does that make sense? Can I ask a clarifying question? Then? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Sorry. Are you talking about the transit specifically or uh, either transit or highways? I can answer the question with, we, we have two funding scenarios in the transportation policy plan. Okay. The fiscally constrained that. is the current revenue. The increased revenue is the more of the vision. What would we do if we had more revenues available for the region? And so one example on the transit side, uh, the governor's proposal uh, for additional transit funding would provide revenues for a lot of that increased revenue scenario to be delivered. Not necessarily all of it, but a substantial amount of it. And so our scenarios are meant to allow us to have a vision in place that we can pull projects from if revenue becomes available, either expected or unexpected. Thank you. Okay. Council Member Chambers. Yes, thank you. I have a question um, and it's sort of related to what he's asking um, in terms of on page 16, the hierarchy of mobility investments. Looks like most of the decision criteria is based upon, um, was it high? It 
It was based upon um, low cost, high return. How much is, can be allocated outside of that? Um, you know, if it's maybe a medium cost, uh, but maybe there's a high need either, you know, based on uh, ADA or based on um, improving uh, conditions within a neighborhood or stationary or planning. How much room, wiggle room is there outside of that um, high uh, return, low cost? Uh, Madam Chair and Council Members, so one of the things that happens in the Transportation Policy Plan is when we're developing it, we work with MnDOT to say, how much money does our region have for what we call mobility, which is essentially expansion, <coughs> making the system bigger or better. In the last um, statewide plan, when they looked forward, they said, well, you have about 50 million in mobility funding for the next four or five years, and then you have zero. And so what we do in our plan is we take that estimate that we get from MnDOT and we say, how would we spend that money? If that's the money we have to improve the system, make it bigger, better. And what happened is um, it's highly dependent on how much you have. If we had hundreds of million every year, we would probably do one big project and some smaller projects or, you know, and we would come to you and have that discussion of how you think about that. But because our level of funding has been so low, um, we have been focusing our investments highly in the low cost, high benefit category of spending. And what we tend to do is put a set aside and then work with MnDOT to develop specific projects for that set aside. And that has been on the order of 20 to 25 million a year. Um, but we also get pressure to do the bigger projects. So sometimes we have less over there and we pile up the money to do one big project, typically a MinPass project. And so that that is definitely the type of discussion you as council members would be involved upon. And what I would expect is if the governor's proposal passes or some form of it passes, we will have increased revenue to the region. It will take a while. MnDOT will work with MnDOT. They'll come to us and they say, we think over the next 20 years, you have X amount more to spend. And we will go through a process of allocating that funding to major projects in the metro area and amending them into the transportation policy plan. So I would foresee that being a major activity after following the session and walking through that process of how much was there, how much went to the metro area, how much do we need for preservation, how much can we spend on expansion, and that will be a policy discussion with the council and with the TAB to reach those conclusions. Thank you. Okay. That's helpful. Council Member Stern. Uh, thank, thank you. Uh, Chair, um, I just uh, was kind of looking and we've had some issues with like bike trails in Dakota County and Scott County, the areas I represent. And it seems like if you have the criteria where it's really geared to transit and density, we really don't have to stand a chance because we don't have transit out there other than the red line, it's close by. And it just seems like there maybe should be different criteria that allow the suburbs to compete because there's you know several bike trails, a lot of work uh, with the trails, but with the criteria set up, we have no, no chance of getting additional bike trails in our area, even though there's a, there's a lot of great areas for bike trails to be. Madam Chair, if I can respond. I, you know, I think that is just one criteria. And so there are definitely criteria that allow those parts of the region to compete well in other areas. Um, the other thing I would note is trails are also funded with other funding from the council through our park system. And so there are opportunities to fund um, bike trails in particular with different types of sources with different intent. Uh, but I do know that we, we actually do fund a good variety of, of bike facilities throughout the entire region through our process. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? All right, 
Thanks, Amy and Cole. Um, we are going to, we usually really push to end at six. We're not gonna end at six tonight. Um, however, we are gonna move the budget presentation to next time um, because otherwise I will keep going for way too long. Um, and we do have a budget presentation at the full council on Wednesday, so that'll get us started. That works. All right. Madam Chair, let me introduce Jerry Sutton. She's the lead of our, in charge of our contracted transit services uh, section of MTS. And we'll talk about probably a lot of, maybe you came to the council thinking just with Metro Transit and how we provide that. Uh, but I really want to see how the other components of our regional transit system fit into the transit network that you have a say over as the council members. So I'll turn it over to Jerry. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Committee members, good afternoon. My name is Jerry Sutton, and I am the Assistant Director for Contracted Transit Services. Um, I'm here today to give you a high-level overview of the work done by the Contracted Transit Services Work Group within MTS. There are multiple public transit providers within the metro area, and of course, the council is by far the largest. Um, there are two divisions within the Metropolitan Council, uh, that's MTS and Metro Transit. MTS delivers all of its service uh, using contractors and Metro Transit uh, delivers, directly operates all of its services. I've highlighted in blue and yellow the work group that I will be focusing on this afternoon. In addition to the council service in the middle box there, um, you will see uh, the suburban transit providers and they deliver about 5% of the region's public transit rides. Um, these are communities that opted out of the fixed route system in the mid 80s um, and they provide service within their communities um, and primarily express service to the uh, downtowns and to the U of M. And our bottom box is the University of Minnesota. They provide about 4% of the public transit rides in the region, and they serve the U of M campuses only. The biggest uh, MTS program from both an expense and a visibility perspective is Metro Mobility. Uh, Metro Mobility service is the product of requirements established by the Federal Transit Administration to comply with the Americans with Disabilities Act. Metro Mobility is often referred to as complementary service because the requirements are based on service that is available uh, to users of the fixed route system. Um, and so uh, all Metro Mobility customers are certified for the service because they have a disability that prevents them from being able to use the fixed route system, at least under certain circumstances. To be considered complementary to fixed route, service must be provided within a three quarter mile corridor around both sides of local fixed route service. That means that fixed routes that operate only during the peak um, or peak express routes do not trigger the complementary requirement, the Metro Mobility Service. The state of Minnesota has broadened the service requirements beyond the Americans with Disabilities Act in two ways. First, the geographic coverage area goes beyond the three quarter mile corridor and covers all communities that were part of the transit taxing district in 2006. The second state requirement is that we provide first door through first door service. During uh, the past year, uh, we had a little under 26,000 unique users of the system um, of the 62,000 that are currently certified. On average, Metro Mobility staff process 800 applications in a month, with 62% of those applications coming in from new candidates. One of the most notable stats is that ridership has grown by 30% over the past five years. This slide gives you an image of the service area as I just described. The light blue shaded area represents the three quarter mile corridor around local fixed route, and we refer to that footprint as the ADA service area. It's important to understand that we cannot have capacity constraints within the light blue area. This basic requirement drives our service delivery model and funding needs. Capacity constraints are defined as either the denial of a ride request or system service quality that doesn't meet established thresholds. 
We have established performance thresholds for key indicators such as on-time pickups, appointment times, onboard times, and telephone hold times. Um, and those thresholds have been accepted by the Federal Transit Administration. The gray area um, is also part of the Metro Mobility Service area, and this is the area that is required by state statute. Um, any ride that doesn't fall wholly within that blue shaded area is called a non-ADA ride. Um, and non-ADA rides do not need to comply with the federal requirements. This table gives you a summary of many of the basic Metro Mobility Service elements. I have already highlighted the top six, so I will skip down to the trip request line. Um, we are allowed to have anywhere between a one and 14 day reservation window. Uh, we are using a four day window, uh, which is pretty standard across the country. Under scheduling, we are allowed to negotiate requested times within one hour on either side of the requested time. So if a customer requests a 10 a.m. ride, we can offer them between a 9 a.m. and an 11 a.m. solution. Um, the Metro Mobility Fair um, can be up to two times the regular route local fare. So the local fixed route fare today is $2 during the off peak and $2.50 during the peak. Um, so our cap would be four during the off peak, five during the peak, and we are currently 50 cents under um, the cap. Um, finally, trip permit purpose, we are not allowed to prioritize trips based on purpose, and we do not collect that information when we accept reservations. Uh, we plan to do a more in-depth presentation, as Nick mentioned, about the Metro Mobility Program uh, at, the, at a full council meeting. Um, in the meantime, if you are interested or want to study up before that presentation, um, this is the Metro Mobility Task Force Report that was uh, completed in early 2018. Council Member Barber was a part of that effort. Um, and I think it gives a, a good... Um, pretty thorough uh, description of the program and why we do what we do and some of the current um, thoughts that we have about how we might uh, improve service. Um, and Jenna can send out a link to that uh, report. Transit Link is general public dial a ride, which means that there are no eligibility requirements. The service operates in the more suburban and rural areas of the seven county metro because we do not duplicate fixed route services. So trip requests are screened by the reservationists to determine whether there is a reasonable fixed route solution for either all of the trip or a part of the trip. Um, if there's a fixed route solution, the customer is provided the route and schedule information and the trip is not booked on transit link. Sometimes the customer is connected to a fixed route um, station uh, to complete the trip um, and then sometimes the trip is completely delivered on the transit link system. Service is available on weekdays from 6 a.m. to 7 p.m. And when trip requests are screened for fixed route solutions, we consider a walking distance of half a mile during the summer and a quarter mile during the winter. MTS operates about 10%. Um, Mary, one sec. Um, oh, sorry. Member Atlas and your breakfast. Um, would you mind going back to the previous slide? Could you share a little bit about who is the type of user for this? And, and where are the service areas, but like, what's the typical? Um, Madam Chair, um, council members, I'm um, not sure that I know what a typical user is. We don't collect ge our demographic information on these customers. Uh, we do know that we uh, transport a lot of customers to school. Um, I think these are probably community college um, students in this particular picture. Um, we take a lot of work trips and I think there are some medical trips. Um, I, I think it's a, just a very broad range of the, of the needs that we meet. So the only criteria is that they're not in a service area served by a fixed route and they're not eligible for metropolitan mobility. That's correct. Uh, Councilmember Cummings. Sorry, Madam Chair. 
Um, do people, do individuals recertify annually that qualify for the dialogue? Madam Chair, um, council members, the, um, there is no certification for transit link and for Metro mobility, it varies. Um, many of our customers recertify every four years. Uh, depending on the condition, we do have some customers that are permanently certified, but it is possible to be certified for uh, six months or a year if it's a temporary disability. MTS operates about 10% of the council's fixed route service under contract. Uh, we work closely with Metro Transit planning staff to determine which routes are significantly below performance standards and consider those routes candidates for contracted services. Through this process, we are able to retain routes that might otherwise be eliminated. Many times the service will switch from a 40 foot bus operated by Metro Transit to either a 30 foot bus or smaller under the contract. Uh, sometimes the route's productivity improves and they are transferred back to Metro Transit and we might swap a lower uh, performing route in exchange. Um, this map shows the routes that are provided under contract. Uh, the council has made an effort to make it seamless to the customer. So the buses look the same as Metro Transit. Um, the bus stops <coughs> look the same. Uh, we share some bus stops and all the information about these routes is uh, available on Metro Transit's website. Uh, one route that I want to mention because it is somewhat unique to our other contracts is Route 903 also known as the red line service um, that runs from Wall of America to Apple Valley. And um, this service is owned by the council, but operated under contract to Minnesota Valley Transit Authority, who then subcontracts with Schmidt and Son, private contractor. Uh, we also manage a subsidized van lease program for commuter van pools. Van pools originating out of the uh, outside of the seven county metro are provided a 50% lease subsidy, and those that originate within the seven county metro uh, are funded at 55%. And about half of our van pools originate outside of the metro. The van pools are self formed, and participants decide which vehicles. Uh, vehicle works for their pool with four sizes to choose from. Leases run from month to month and can be discontinued with a one month notice. The council currently contracts with Enterprise to provide the vehicles and some administrative functions. Uh, this table provides a summary of the contracts managed by MTS. Uh, in total, uh, we have 19 service contracts with a 2019 operating budget of over 108 million. Uh, we, our work is accomplished with 24 full-time <coughs> staff. Um, our contracts are delivered with over 800 council-owned vehicles, and we currently lease 54 vans through Enterprise. Uh, in 2018, our ridership totaled over 5 million. I will touch on the suburban providers just a bit. Um, as I mentioned on the first slide, just over 5% of the metro area transit rides are provided by the suburban providers. Uh, the majority of their service is Peak Express to the downtowns in U of M. Um, MTS's primary relationship with the suburban providers is the provision of fleet for use on their services. And I'll talk a bit more about that in a minute. So one of our other uh, very big responsibilities is to manage a large fleet. Um, the fleet that is council owned is almost 1,200 vehicles. Um, and of course, this includes just over 800 uh, operated under contract by uh, MTS and then 327 that are used by the suburban providers. Uh, we have a team of three staff that manage the vehicles used for both MTS and the suburban suburban providers, um, and those vehicles are at 16 different garages. Um, the fleet team purchases the vehicles and equipment, oversees the ongoing maintenance, asset tracking, and then also ensures that they are properly retired and disposed of. Um, and as you can see, we have a wide range of vehicles in our fleet, ranging from sedans to articulated buses. 
this is a list of some of um, MTS's primary work items that are of interest to council <coughs> members and how they've typically been handled in the past. Uh, we competitive, competitively procure our contracts, typically with five-year terms. Uh, so with 19 contracts, you can expect on average three to four new awards in a year. Uh, staff will present the recommendations um, and seek council approval for the contract awards. In addition, uh, occasionally we need to come back to the council for approval to amend already executed contracts. In addition to service contracts, we buy vehicles and onboard technology each year and will likely seek approval of purchases at various times throughout the year. On a quarterly basis, we have provided ridership uh, the ridership report, and John will join me in just a minute to um, give you a little bit of a ridership um, snapshot. And um, we do that quarterly. Um, and then if we have any significant policy changes pertaining to our service, uh, we would present that information, that as an information item and seek um, uh, feedback from council members. Uh, Semi-annually, we have provided a Metro Mobility status report, and then annually, the chair of the Transportation Accessibility Advisory Committee has provided an update on that committee's work. Um, and finally, it's rather common for uh, customers to contact council members with concerns or issues with service, and in particular, Metro Mobility. Um, we're happy to receive those comments from you, and we have a number of tools that we can use to investigate, um, including call recordings, onboard cameras, vehicle GPS, and transaction software. Um, so usually we are able to conduct a pretty thorough investigation and take appropriate action. Um, and then we can work with you to craft a response back to the customer. And that concludes my presentation. I have, um, I wanna leave you with this list of key contacts and uh, introduce these staff to you. Uh, first, um, Christine Kennan here in the front row and she oversees the Metro Mobility Program. Uh, John Harper, um, Manager of Contract and Transit Services. Uh, so he oversees Transit Link, uh, Fixed Route and the Van Pool Program. And then Paul Fulton, who oversees our fleet staff. So John, do you want to? John is going to give so our. Um, any uh, general questions before we get into the ridership? Um, Madam Chair and committee members. As Jerry mentioned, uh, my name is John Harper, and um, I work in the in the areas of MTS that are not Metro Mobility. So uh, the programs that she mentioned are fixed route contracts, our transit link service, and our Metro Van Pool program. I also present to the Transportation Committee quarterly our ridership. Typically, the ridership report that is given to the council. Uh, to this committee is a council-focused uh, ridership report for the first three quarters of the year. And at the end of the year, we incorporate all the regional providers into a regional, annual regional ridership report so that uh, those other providers that you'll see here in just a moment include the U of M and suburban providers. So the first three quarters will be council and uh, the fourth quarter, as I mentioned, will be regional. I have just a few slides for you today to give you a flavor of the, of the ridership information. Uh, normally we are doing a comparison of this year compared to last year, quarter to quarter. I'm not gonna do that uh, for you today. Just gonna give you a, a quick overview of the ridership. This slide shows 10 years worth of ridership and shows the uh, various colors in the stack bars indicate the uh, type of service. The blue uh, portion of the bars that are the majority of the bar are our local service. That is the workhorse of our network. So those are the, the routes that run primarily all day, stop uh, eight times a mile up and down our city streets. Uh, 
uh, most of our, our service and most of our ridership are along those routes. The next uh, bus service type is express, that's the red bar, and uh, those tend to be rush hour only services, those tend to be commuter uh, services. Express is closed door, uh, I believe the criteria is five or more miles. It's either four or five, but it's, ex it's closed door on the highway for a portion of the, uh, of the route. And many of those come in from suburban areas. Um, and this is, this is regional, so this includes those suburban provider services as well. Uh, the, you can see the green bar and the gray bar that appears halfway through this uh, set, of, uh, set of bars, those are our rail lines, our metro uh, blue line is green, and our metro green line is gray. Sorry about the colors, but uh, that's the way it works sometimes. And as those appear, you see that the bus ridership has gone down and the rail ridership has become a larger portion of our ridership. Uh, that is because, uh, primarily because Route 16, one of the one or two largest routes in our network became the Green Line. And so if you take away the largest bus route, put it into rail, you're gonna switch the modes like that. And, and so you can see that across time. There are a lot of different colors at the very top of these lines, and those indicate these other programs that, that we operate, and those uh, include Metro Mobility. Um, you know, in the overall scheme, it's not uh, as big as some of these other programs, it's a very important part. And our Transit Link program, which is quite small, is Bamboo, which you know, is, is a, a slice uh, across the top there. And you can see the ridership uh, over the last 10 years, uh, trended up and then over the last couple of years has trended down. We can talk in detail uh, across future meetings about, about those trends and, and how they are impacting ridership. So this slide is here to show you that across the year, the ridership essentially has two peaks. We are a spring and fall ridership kind of system. Uh, for those of you who have been around in February of this year know why February of this year is not a high ridership year. Uh, you take the bus to work if, and maybe shopping if you need to and you don't do much else and you just hunker down. And so you'll see the, the September, October and the March, April uh, time frames are really our, our highest times. Uh, winter for uh, the reasons I just mentioned and summer because of vacations primarily tend to be lower ridership seasons. So when we look at ridership trends, we tend to look at that spring and fall period for um, to, to make the decisions that we're making in our, in our system. This is uh, puts numbers on that first set of bars that you saw. So this talks about local bus, express bus, uh, BRT, bus rapid transit, that category includes both highway BRT or the Metro Red Line, and it also includes arterial BRT or the A Line at this point. So those are lumped into that single category. The rail lines are broken out for you, uh, and you can see then also the Metro Mobility Service, our Metro Vanpool Service. The other dial-a-ride uh, service, uh, Transit Link is the Met Council's general public dial-a-ride. There are two, uh, well, the three suburban areas now that have their own dial ride services uh, within their own community areas, and the U of M also has a dial ride so that's why the labeling like that. And you can see the relative sizes of those. So uh, about half, well, a little more than half of all the rides we provide in this region are on local bus. So this takes the, uh, this shows providers of all the modes that the provider operates. And Met Council is a single provider in this context, so that includes Metro Transit and MTS contracted work. About 90% of the ridership in the region is operated by the Met Council or provided by the Met Council. And you can see the, the other providers. Uh, Jerry mentioned earlier about how the council is responsible for Metro Red Line and contracts with MBTA to operate that service. The, the uh, flip is also true, and that is Maple Grove hires the council to run their service, uh, some of their service. And Metro Transit runs uh, about 800,000 rides a year for uh, Maple Grove. That's uh, 
the, their express service. They hired a private company to run the local service in Ballarat. So we do have some providers hiring other providers to do work, and it makes the presentation of ridership a bit complicated when you try to pull those pieces apart. Uh, but it is the complexity of our region. So that's the ridership report. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, this is a quarterly report that I provide uh, that talks primarily about the council work at the first three quarters and will bring in this regional perspective at the end of the year. Uh, I'll take any questions if you have them. And I'll try to answer them as best I can. Any questions for the presenter? All right. Well, thank you, Jerry John. Thank Appreciate you. it. Uh, and we did uh, defer the budget presentation to next time, but I know you have the materials and our budget <coughs> experts are in the in the audience. So we have Ed Petrie and Heather's August and Peter, and they can answer questions if you um, have questions ahead of when we review it. So they'd be more than happy, I'm sure, to address any questions you have. So that, that concludes our business for the evening. If you have additional questions on anything, reach out to the staff and they'll be more than happy to fill you in in some more details. And with that, we are adjourned.